The next thing I want to talk about is um, acidity and basicity. Acidity and basicity. All right, so the capacity of alcohols to uh, gain or lose a proton. And this is going to be crucial as we move into talking about the reactions that alcohols can undergo. Uh, very many of the, uh, these processes are going to involve an alcohol either picking up or losing um, a proton. So let's first talk about basicity. So alcohols are what I think anyone would describe as being weakly basic. Okay, So the equilibrium that we would be discussing here is, oops, so there is our alcohol with our with the two lone pairs and what we are going to describe here is the alcohol picking up a proton from some acidic source okay and so we, this is an equilibrium process of course and so the the um the product of that protonation is going to be an oxygen obviously it's positively charged because it's picked up a, a positive proton um, and there's our, our counter ion. Okay, so this is an example. Whenever you have oxygen that's positively charged, this is an example of an oxonium ion. Okay, so we'll be using that term uh, when we're talking about mechanisms. So it's an oxonium ion. And uh, what we'd like to know then is, is exactly where does this equilibrium lie? And the most convenient way to do this is to, rather than talking about the basicity of the alcohol, we can talk about the acidity of the protonated oxonium ion, right? Uh, so we're just we're just describing this equilibrium by talking about the pKa of this material, and that way we can compare it um, on the spectrum of things that we're used to thinking about. So we don't have to jump between two different uh, um, uh, uh, scales. Okay. So the pKa of the protonated alcohols. So we could just pick. Um, one reference point here. So this would be protonated methanol. You see methanol with an extra proton. Um, the pKa of that is negative 2.2. So it is a pretty darn strong acid, right? Quite, quite acidic. Um, and for comparison, uh, protonated water um, has a pKa of about negative 1.7. Okay, so uh, methanol is uh, actually uh, slightly more acidic um, than, than water in this case. Okay, so that's the basicity. What about acidity? Okay, acidity. So uh, obviously we're talking about the the opposite scenario here where uh, we're going to deprotonate um, the alcohol. And in this case, uh, we can think about um, there being an equilibrium um, of the alcohol giving up a proton to water, let's say. And what that's going to generate then is the, the anion of the alcohol um, plus than the protonated water. Okay, so uh, this deprotonated alcohol is going to be called an alkoxide, right? Alkoxide. And so, uh, again, we can uh, get a sense of this equilibrium by um, looking at the pKa values of, of, the, uh, of a variety of alcohols. And now, as with um, anything, uh, any acid or base, the actual structure is going to uh, matter a lot in terms of what the actual acidity or basicity is. So let's look at some categories here. Um, so we look at uh, um, a range of alcohols in terms of um, their sort of their steric hindrance or their substitution pattern. Okay, and then finally methanol. All right, so here we have terbutanol, isopropanol, ethanol, um, sorry, that's ethanol, and then methanol, right? So kind of that, that series of, of uh, substitution. 
um, and we could take a look at what is the, the PKA trend here. So the PKA trend is as follows. We have 18, 16.5, 16.0, and then 15.5. All right, so you can see that as you get more substituted um, in that uh, carbon position of the alcohol, that the, the acidity is going down, right? So, um, or another, uh, maybe I should change that around actually. Um, the acidity is increasing as we get less substituted, okay? So uh, the, the less substituted, the more acidic, okay? Remember, the lower the pKa, the more acidic um, is uh, the, the, uh, the acid, okay? So uh, what's going on here? Why is it that having a more substituted alcohol like terbutanol, it makes it less acidic. What's happening there? Um, and basically, what happens is that, um, right, so the, the, this equilibrium is going to be affected by how stable your conjugate base is. That's pretty much what dictates how acidic something will be, is how happy is it going to be once it's given up the proton. And so there's a lot of things that are going to impact the stability um, of, of a conjugate base. And one is sort of the inherent electronics um, of, of how happy that conjugate base is to be an anion. But in all of these cases, the overriding electronic impact is, is pretty much due to the oxygen. So it's all the same, right? It's all the same electronegativity of just an oxygen atom. And there's certainly some influence of the, uh, the adjacent um, carbon substitution. Um, but that's, that's uh, the, probably the less important factor. What's more important is actually, remember, this isn't just an alkoxide floating free, um, free of anything else, just floating free in space. This is an alkoxide that's actually going to be in a solvent. It's going to um, be solvated by um, whatever molecules you have. And in this experiment, we're talking about being in water. So if we can solvate that, alcohol, that alkoxide, um, we, can, uh, we can stabilize it right, because the solvent can actually stabilize that anion. And so as you get less substituted, the alkoxide, is, it becomes more, uh, it becomes easier to solvate, is, is more easily solvated. Okay, solvated just means that the solvent is stabilizing it, right, it's, it's dissolved in the solvent uh, more easily. And so that's, that's going to be a more stable situation. So as you start to bulk up the carbon aspect, right, so we've got this anionic oxygen and then this big bulky carbon, uh, you know, mass attached to it. Um, those two things are sort of in, uh, incompatible in terms of um, solvation. And so if you've just got a tiny bit like in methanol and then the alkoxide, that can be solvated um, more easily than the, uh, in the case of the terbutyl. Okay, so that's how sterics impacts on acidity, but it's certainly not the only impact. So we, we absolutely can see um, electronic impacts. Okay, so um, we can just do this with uh, one simple uh, comparison. Okay, get my right color here. So if we compare ethanol to a very closely related molecule, trifluoroethanol, right? So here we have the same, the same hydroxy, we have the same uh, carbon attached to the hydroxy, so there's really no big steric difference here. Um, but then on the next carbon, we have either three hydrogens, right? Three hydrogens or three fluorine atoms. And of course, fluorine is, is massively electronegative. Um, so how would that impact the acidity? We'll look at pKa. Uh, and the uh, pK of ethanol is 16, the pK of trifluoroethanol is 12.4, okay? So trifluoroethanol is much more acidic, and that hopefully makes sense to you that as you have electron withdrawing groups sucking away um, electron density, that's going to be a stabilizing uh, effect on an anion, right? An anion that negative charge, if we have substituents which are inductively pulling some of that electron density away and sharing it throughout the, the molecule, 
that's going to be stabilizing. So we have inductive stabilization, right, leading to greater acidity. Okay, so that's that can certainly be a very powerful um, effect for acidity. And now the the next one, okay, this is going to be resonance stabilization. Well, how are we going to do that in a, in an alcohol? Um, remember, an alcohol, uh, technically speaking, is going to be um, a, a situation where a hydroxy is attached to an sp3 hybridized carbon. So there, you don't get any resonance effects. It's just there's no resonance forms to to draw when you have an sp3 hybridized carbon. So in this case, uh, what we'll do is look at um, phenols. Right, so a phenol is going to be attached to an sp2 uh, carbon. So there is that pi system to, to think about. And there we can talk about the impact of other substituents that are going to be conjugated with that pi system. Okay, And as you might expect, this actually has a pretty dramatic effect. So we could look at a series of phenols with different functionality and get a sense of, of how the pKa um, is impacted by those different groups. Okay, so let me just draw in some of the phenols. Okay. Move my picture up here. Okay. And this will be our reference point here where it's just phenol with no substituent. Okay, so just we'll, we'll start with this here. We have a series of increasingly donating um, substituents. You'll recognize these from our EAS unit uh, where uh, these are all um, uh, activating groups for EAS because they're increasing the electron density of the aromatic ring. So ask yourself, what would be the impact of on the acidity on acidity of the phenol um, by increasing the electron density of the aromatic ring? Well, if you think about it, it we are generating or we're going to be generating an O minus. So the more electron density that's in the aromatic ring that that O minus is attached to, that's actually going to destabilize that O minus, right? Because you already have. Uh, too many electrons in terms of an anion on the oxygen and now if you put more electron density on the ring that's attached to that oxygen that's going to destabilize okay so we can see that in terms of the acidities so the pKa of phenol itself is 9.9 .9. and as we start to add uh, electron donating substituents we can see that pKa creep up All right. okay so it's not a dramatic effect Right? It's not going up by, by um, orders of magnitude necessarily, uh, but you can see that it increases. So the more electron donating the substituent, the higher the pKa goes. And this is pKa. And by the same token, you can imagine then what would happen if we start to put on electron withdrawing groups on the phenol. So over here, I can do this series. Uh, nitro. And then let's just do one that's nice and dramatic. We'll put on three nitro groups under our phenol. Let's see what happens. Okay. All right. So we'll do the pKa for, for these. Okay. So here's with a, a, a chlorine substituent. And we can see our pKa start to drop. We're getting more and more acidic. Uh, with one nitro group, we're down to 7.2. And then what happens if we have three nitro groups? Well, you, you have a pretty darn strong acid at that point, um, almost down to, to pK of zero, right? So again, this trend holds uh, as well for the electron withdrawing groups that as you're now uh, pulling away electron density, either inductively or via resonance from that aromatic ring, um, you're stabilizing the anionic charge that we would put on the oxygen if we deprotonated, okay? So there we have three different effects for acidity, we have a steric component, which uh, basically comes down to solvation of the conjugate base. And then we have inductive um, stabilization um, of, the, of the alkoxide. And then we have a resonance um, effect where, um, you know, that can either be stabilizing or destabilizing um, 
uh, in terms of uh, phenolic uh, types of hydroxyls. Okay, so what is the upshot of all of this? Well, uh, this matters um, significantly on a, on a practical level um, when we start thinking about the chemistry that we're going to potentially do with um, alkoxides. Right, so alkoxides can react very nicely in a number of different ways. Um, and so uh, if we want to generate an alkoxide, we have to make sure that we match up the base that we're choosing in terms of the, the strength of the base to the acidity of the thing we're deprotonating, in this case, the alcohol. Okay, so if we want to achieve a, a full-blown deprotonation of an alcohol, we need to pick a base that's strong enough to do that. All right, so something like um, sodium bicarb um, is, is basically not going to work. And the same thing if we pick uh, just a simple tertiary amine, a tertiary amine is not basic enough to do this. And so we won't see deprotonation of the alcohol. Now I say no reaction. Keep in mind that uh, deprotonation or protonation is just an equilibrium. So to, to be fair, there actually will be some uh, equilibrium of deprotonation, but it's going to be rather small in most of these cases. And um, for a lot of the chemistry we're gonna talk about, you need full deprotonation. Now, sometimes you don't, but um, if we want to get an alkoxide and, and have that stoichiometrically in the flask, we're going to need a base that's significantly stronger um, than either of these. Okay, so that's not going to work. What we're going to want is a nice, robust, strong base. So uh, something like sodium hydride would certainly do the job. So we can get to um, our, our alkoxide as the sodium salt in this case and this is useful because we lose the rest of it as H2 gas so hydride and, and proton go to give hydrogen gas. Um, we can also use something like an amid so sodium amid or potassium amid uh, very much strong enough to deprotonate an alkoxide absolutely and so here again we will get to the sodium salt of our alkoxide the byproduct here is ammonium, I'm sorry, ammonia. All right, a uh, Grignard. So anytime you have, um, well, uh, many organometallics, let me say, uh, a Grignard, for example, um, or an alkyl lithium, right? These are very strong, strongly basic uh, materials. They basically act as if they were um, free carbon ions. Um, these are absolutely going to be strong enough to deprotonate an alcohol. All right, so here we would have our alkoxide, and then the counterion is going to be the magnesium uh, bromide species. And there, the, um, the other product, this is something important to keep in mind, is going to be the protonated organic of our Grignard. So there we're going to have that R prime H, right? So we just we'll pick up a proton on the organometallic. And here, a uh, similar situation, we would have now the lithium salt um, because that's what we're dealing with, an organolithium. And then also we will have the protonated organometallic, okay? So this is important for generating alkoxides to pick these strong enough bases. And it's also something important to keep in mind, especially these lower two, in terms of uh, making sure that you're uh, not mixing these organometallics with free alcohols or phenols if you don't want that protonation to happen, right? So don't mix a Grignard um, that you might be trying to use in a different way with an, a free alcohol if you don't want to end up with your just protonated material, okay? So that's, a, that's something to definitely watch out for, that that can happen. But uh, and just in terms of generating alkoxides that we want to do chemistry with, um, you pick a strong enough base like any of these and, and you're uh, definitely going to be um, strong enough to generate those alkoxides. Okay, so in the next video we're going to move on and start to talk about some of the uh, rich and elaborate chemistry that alcohols can undergo.